Hey folks, this week we're doing another feed drop. Today's episode is Demystifying Academia Part 1 on Afterlives with Kara Cooney. Kara and her co-host Jordan do an excellent job of describing and explaining a lot about how academia works and really get into the nuts and bolts of what the application process for grad school looks like. This episode covers a lot of what our show has also discussed at times with guests. So, we thought this was an excellent opportunity for a feed swap. Kara's episode of Ancient Office Hours will be available through her feed in case you missed it or if you'd like to re-listen. I hope you enjoy this special off-week episode. Welcome to Afterlives with Kara Cooney, in which we discuss ancient Egyptian history and relevant current events that we think will be of interest to our audience. I am Kara Cooney, and I'm a professor of Egyptology at UCLA. This podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at UCLA. In recent years, I've become active in communicating with the general public about the history of ancient Egypt through lectures, interviews, social media, books, and guest appearances. This podcast is my opportunity to take the kinds of deep dives into history that are not always possible in academic formats. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest episode. Um, How are you doing today? I'm okay. It's Sunday. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's Monday. I have to be on campus at nine for grad orientation, grad student orientation with our masks. And I don't know what to do. So I'm kind of, I don't of, know if this is like just a me thing, but I find it very hard to read people's body language yes. with like half their face covered up. And I find myself very much like finding interactions very uncomfortable because I can't see half their face. Jordan, I haven't really tried. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm back at work now. So I was like, have you taught? No, you no, I haven't taught school, yet, but just like being back at work and like talking to coworkers yeah. and stuff like that. And it's just like, looking in I don't eyes know. Like, are you making to... a weird face? Yeah. I can't like read your body language as yeah. well. I find yeah. it very uncomfortable so so I'm worried about that but otherwise I'm fine it'll be great it'll be great yeah it'll be awesome. I'm excited to go back and have some stuff yeah. back in person yeah just not every day I don't my go back every day. my good friend texted the other day that she's a professor at a university on the east coast and she got an email from a student saying I have COVID yeah and she's in a tiny classroom yeah. with you know 20 students and she's like oh okay well I'm going to go get tested. And of course the university doesn't do testing on Friday. Cause you know, COVID takes the weekend off. Um, it's crazy. And it's all madness. so she, and she had to go get an appointment at an urgent care clinic and all this nonsense. And she had like a lovely weekend plan to see like friends and that's sad. Just, I mean, and then like the university was like, don't email like the students will do contact tracing, but like no one's contacted her still. <laughs> And she's just like, this is a mess. What a mess. So, At least UCLA benefits UCLA, I think from is, yeah. California having the lowest COVID rates in the country. Yep. That's insanity. Yep. Who knew that could happen ever here? Well, and I think UCLA with having the, you know, vending machines with the COVID tests, mm-hmm. they're, they're doing it actually compared to other universities. You don't have to make a an appointment, yeah. go to a place, the rapid tests are allowed. It's good. Okay. Um, so today's episode... I think everyone's been asking us about these types of things. So I think we're going to event, we're going to touch on them today. I think this might end up being a two-parter. I think we probably will have yeah. a lot to say and there's, you know, a lot of things to cover. Um, but we're going to demystify the ivory tower. Talk about the academic world. It's on point because I'm getting so many emails from students saying, oh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm interested in coming mm-hmm. to UCLA. Tell me about your program. And I end up having the same conversation with like 17 different people, which is fine. But um, it would also be good to say more about how this works. Okay. Um, But I think especially we'll be talking about, you know, academia in general, Mm -hmm. but, you know, specifically Egyptology, since that's what we're both. Grad school in the humanities, how the academic game works. Um, So I just pulled, you know, a definition of the ivory tower. Because I was wondering, I was like, where does this term even come from? All this stuff. So it's a metaphorical place or an atmosphere where people are happily cut off from the rest of the world in favor of their own pursuits, uh, usually mental or esoteric. I don't know about happily cut I know, off. that's what I thought was I funny. think the word happily <laughs> needs to go, and otherwise I completely agree with the definition, but uh, most people in the ivory tower are ensconced in their own velvet prison, yes, I would argue. I 100% concur. Um, yeah. So the goal of today's episode is to try to demystify some mm-hmm. of these, these topics, you know, ranging from 
degree programs available in Egyptology if you're interested. You know, the application process can be very scary. Uh, PhD coursework, what is the PhD process? Uh, you know, There's exams, a lot proposing. A lot. And then, you know, post uh, graduation, so postdocs, job, yeah. fields, all yeah. act, which I we're going to make its own episode. Yeah, I, I think, think so. it deserves its own episode. There's lots to say there. And so much is changing with the yep. anti intellectualism, particularly against the humanities of the yes. day and the lack of full time tenure track jobs. Yep. And so people That's with whole... PhDs in the humanities used to be employable because they used to have positions that were full time. And with those now being cut right and left, it, people with these PhDs now mm -hmm. need to go into other fields. Yep. So this will probably end up being a two-parter, as we mm -hmm. said. So uh, hold on to your cap and gown. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Uh, okay, I'm ready. So I think first I want to maybe both of us share our academic mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. of, you know, like undergrad, maybe everyone always asks us the question of why do you become an Egyptologist, oh, yeah. Yeah. all that kind of good stuff. Um, so maybe we can just both share quickly and then go through kind of uh, chronologically. Should I start first? Yeah. Okay. Since go I'm for older. it. So, so you might, yeah, might have a different, I, uh, I'm know, sure different I do. So much has changed, changed within yeah. this academic world in the last 20 years. So I graduated from college in 1994 from UT Austin, and I went directly into an academic program. I went into Johns Hopkins University where they gave me full tuition waiver and a stipend. And I was there for eight years. And during one of those years, I taught for somebody on sabbatical at Howard University. So I got a full year of four, four, that means four classes, four classes mm -hmm. each semester teaching in, in that one year. And then in the last two years, um, I worked with uh, a, the, a group called the Center for Advanced Visual Stud wait, Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. And I was in Egypt and in Europe doing research one of those years. And then the second year I was on a campus at the National Gallery East Building. And then I spent one year at UCLA. And then I, and I was just there as a lecturer short term. And then I had a three-year teaching postdoc at Stanford University in the now defunct Introduction to the Humanities program, teaching freshmen how to write and argue and do all kinds of things. Cool. And then... Uh, during that time, I was working for LACMA, and I was co-curator of the Tutankhamun um, reboot, mm -hmm. if you like, um, and LACMA was the first venue where the King Tut um, gold of the pharaohs, I think it was called, was, was started, and so I was a part of writing those labels and getting all of that done, did a lot of tours and like, you know, gave tours to famous people, and it was a crazy time between Stanford and, and LACMA. So when you met Brendan Fraser? I met Brendan Fraser. Yeah. yeah, I met Brendan Fraser at the opening, which was a big party with camels and dancing ladies, oh, and camels. it was it was a crazy opening in a tent. Um, and very uh, orientalist. Yeah, very orientalist, <laughs> like straight up, um, full bore. And then I was at the Getty um, for about three years, and I was the Getty Research Institute, where I ran the um, Villa Scholars Program for Antiquity Studies, mm -hmm. and also worked with the the research scholars who were coming from abroad and from the United States to spend small amounts of time at the Getty doing their own research. Kind of like, I call it like the cruise director of other people's research, mm -hmm. which is fine. And then while I was there, a job opened up at UCLA for art and architecture and uh, visual studies of uh, within the field. And I applied for that, got onto the shortlist, got the job, mm -hmm. As soon as I got the job, it was within the recession of 2008. They told me mm. there is no job. Um, mm -mm -mm. The job is gone. And then if it weren't for the Coates and Archaeological Institute at UCLA and four donors to come in and make that job oh. financially neutral, I would not have the position at UCLA that I do. That's I would awesome. still be at the Getty, I assume. And um, so I left the Getty to come to UCLA and I have not looked back from that. And then throughout that time, mm -hmm. I have published a number of books. I did a TV show back in 2008, 2009 called Out of Egypt with Discovery Channel and um, did a lot of other, you know, it was trade books and, and some TV appearances. And, and now we have this crazy You've podcast. advanced within UCLA, right? Yeah, now I'm a full professor. So yeah. I started as assistant professor, went through to the associate professor track, and now I'm a full professor and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. And I have been chair now for five years. Mm -hmm. um, this will be my sixth year and my second term, and we shall see what the future holds. So, which is great. 
<laughs> I don't know if I would agree with that. But Jordan, you you go ahead. You go ahead. So what's my yours. my story? I went to um, undergrad in Philadelphia at Temple University, and I, you know, most state affiliated schools yeah. don't have Egyptology programs. So I did uh, Greek and Roman classics, and I double majored in archaeology as well because I knew I wanted to go down the archaeology ancient world uh, route. Um, while I was in undergrad, I had the opportunity to go on a dig in Egypt run by the Redfords out of uh, Penn State University. So I got to go to Egypt finally, you know, confirmed all my uh, ambitions that I wanted to focus in on Egypt for ancient world studies. Um, and then, you know, applied for, um, we can talk about this later on, but like, I had no idea what I was doing from mm -hmm. undergrad to like apply. Oh, I had PhD, no idea either. PhD. No one tells yeah. you what, no. you know, what to do. No, you need mentorship and guidance mm -hmm. and you need someone within the subculture to give well, you the and best like, advice. Even like my advisors from the classics department, they don't but they don't know Egypt. Don't know. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's actually very different from mm -hmm. Greek and Roman classics mm -hmm. to Egyptology programs and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, they were helpful in saying, oh, you need German and French. So I was yeah. able to at least yeah. do that when I was an undergrad. Um, but I was a for... German double major at UT Austin. So. Smart move. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if I even meant it, but yeah. But anyway, go yeah. ahead. Um, so then I applied for programs, PhDs, but, you know, looking back, like I would never have gotten into one, probably shouldn't have. Um, but then a couple places, you know, pushed me to like the master's, terminal yeah. master's programs. One of them being uh, U Chicago, and the, uh, they had a new center forming at the time called the Center of Middle Eastern Studies, CMES. Um, they had a two years master's program that I got pushed into. And let me interrupt right here, because this is a huge difference from when I applied to the time when Jordan applied for PhD programs. When I applied, there weren't all of these terminal master's programs that are kind of, and I have posted well, about this on my page, a moneymaker for many of these universities. <laughs> yeah. What do you call it? I have, well, I said the, we'll get into the ethics. The but, ethics you know, of some these being, terminal yeah. master's programs, like serious moneymakers. But so now there's, an, there's so much competition for humanities PhD programs, ironic, despite the, 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 the outcome jobs. and the lack of jobs, right? But but so you have lots of students who don't have what they need to get into the PhD program, and then they're expected to get a master's. For those of you that need a master's and this is what you want to do, I always recommend two programs, mm -hmm. which will keep your costs down. Yes. One is Indiana University, uh, because you can usually teach your way through and, um, and, and keep your, your student loans at a, at a minimum. And the other is University of Memphis. Mm -hmm. So I would look for those two. If you do any other master's program, you're going to be in debt up to your eyeballs because you're, you're paying to play. And this pay to play scheme for people like me on the inside is something we must be aware of mm -hmm. and, and say no more where we need to shut down these programs and start to yeah. um, play, play this game differently. But I think it's interesting too, because like when you applied to Hopkins, you didn't have any Egypt. I didn't have experience. any Egypt. You had good had grades. Class. Yeah. You had good grades, yeah. you know, good, probably writing sample, yeah. you know, you know, you're a good student. Yeah. And then they would mold you into the Egyptologist where now it's like when you apply to PhDs, they want you already to have hieroglyphs yeah. and, you know, all these classes and coursework, maybe you've gone on a bunch of digs already. Yeah. And yeah. It's like so Amber, I think you're the last of the millennials that was probably able to pull that off. Right. Cause you got into UCLA without having the masters and any of this other experience. And I think you wouldn't get in today with the amount of competition that there is. Yeah. And you yeah. would have been pushed into one of these other masters. So, so look at those master's programs very, very carefully. Look at the bottom line. And I'm telling you right now that within my subculture, and there's all kinds of different subcultures, you want to look and see which ones are going to have opportunities for you to teach and not build yeah, up that debt. And yeah. Unless you have a bunch of money to spend. If you have a bunch of money. It doesn't matter. <laughs> if your parents it. are like, we're going to pay for your master's no matter yeah, what, then, then you can, you can have fun and, and go to a place like, like, I would love to recommend more people to go to AUC, American University. Mm -hmm in Cairo, but it is very expensive. And the amount of money that you will have to pay out to, to get those two or three years for that master's yep. is considerable. Yep. Yeah. So I ended up choosing the two year CMES program at Chicago, um, which I, I had a very positive experience. I've you know, spoken to other people who have different experiences with those programs, mm -hmm. but I had a very positive experience, really good friend group um, overall. And I think, you know, good Chicago is known for its good solid language foundation. Mm -hmm. So I think got, you know, a good grasp of the language. Um, after that two years, applied for PhD programs and I ended up at UCLA. 
yeah. and here I am still writing right now. So yeah. working on, and the way it worked at UCLA, I'll just point out, and this is the way it often is mm -hmm. for Egyptology right now is because I'm chair, I, and because it, it is, we get only a certain number of spots in our department yep. and you don't want to have too much competition vis-a-vis -vis professors within a department. I very often say, okay, you take that spot and you take that spot. And so I'll give a spot to a seriology or to Hebrew Bible or to Persian studies or, or something mm -hmm. and spots go other places. And then if people decide, oh, I'm going to go to Harvard, or I'm going to Yale, or I'm going to Chicago or what other competing universities are out there, then I'm like, okay, I have somebody in the, in the wings and I'll, cause I have, a, I'll have a deep wait list yep. and I'll pull somebody from that, that wait list. And that's how you got in. So mm -hmm. you got in late, but Later. you, you're, yeah. you're in and um, that's, it, it seems to still be happening that way yeah. for Egyptology at UCLA. Yep. So it's a long, it's a long road, long process. So there are two stories that we'll be pulling, I guess, our, you know, our personal experience from. Oh, can I interrupt um, one another yeah. time? So do you pay any tuition at UCLA? No. Do you get a stipend at UCLA? Yes. Do you have opportunities for other things, other kinds of employment? Mm -hmm. So this is the other thing you want to look for in a PhD yep. program. You do not, if somebody accepts you into a PhD program, we're not even talking about masters. This even happens in PhD mm -hmm. programs. If somebody accepts you into a PhD program and they're like, oh, but you have to pay part of the tuition. We're going to pay 80%. You pay 20%. You need to run the other direction. Yep. If not they say it. it's not worth it. If they say, oh, we're going to pay all of the tuition, but no stipend, you, you're going to be, ah, I would be very leery of that so offer as well. Other job and yeah. Like, how are you going to pay for, it depends on what city you're in. How are yep. you going to pay rent in these expensive cities? Because almost every one of these, these degrees is offered in a very expensive city. Yep. So, yeah. So rolling back to the beginning, what's the main difference between an a MA and a PhD? Yeah. In Egyptology, you know, like what kind of jobs can you get with just an MA? In yeah. most cases, it's like people get the MA because it makes them more competitive for then applying for the PhD. Yeah. Most people, you know, so it's like, what's the difference in the coursework and, you know, uh, what kind of jobs you can get? And I think it is different in the States versus in Europe yeah. and England. Yeah. Um, what kind of things? So I know in England, you can become like a curator of a museum with, yeah. with an MA and you don't yeah. need a, a PhD and all this kind of stuff. So, I, you know, here PhDs are usually required for curatorial positions, yep. but they're not always required for educational positions. So I've seen the MA most useful for people who are going into education of some mm -hmm. kind that can be primary, usually secondary and museum education. The MA is, is very yeah. sought after, but as we see in this age of anti-intellectualism, museums are getting their positions cut right and left as well. And just an example, uh, the Getty recently, and this is probably now 10 years ago, mm -hmm. fired en masse their entire MA trained, very high level education force in favor of acquisitions and buying more art. And so that kind of, and, and who filled that gap, but a number of docents and volunteers. So their museum education, while they have some staff who are trained and have MAs in education or, or, or some sort of area of studies, most of the staff that's on the ground doing their education are, are volunteer. Yeah. So those jobs are going away too. And it, it's, um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm hopeful in this time, this, there's going to be a lot of doom and gloom in this discussion. Yeah. And there has been already. But let me also say that we are moving through a time where the boomers, okay, boomers, <laughs> have taken, have had control of this and have had their hands on all of the resources and all of the power. The boomers are starting to retire. Mm -hmm. And as those boomers, and many have already retired, some are holding on and will not retire, but they will eventually. And as those boomers retire, we're going to see a sea change within the university and museum environment in which we decide as a community how we're going to fill these positions. Yep. How many more adjuncts can we really support? Why are we doing, why are we outsourcing our, our teaching this way and teaching and treating people with such little respect in our university mm -hmm. system? Um, how much contract work are we going to have in museums versus full-time employment? Mm -hmm. And I think that as I often, I so often say in my my other podcasts and in my writing that you often have to hit rock bottom with the needle in your arm in the, in the gas station bathroom yep. before you're like, oh my God, the whole system is falling apart around us. And as we watch universities close their doors or people, students not getting what they, what they want, yeah. people refusing to pay tuition and take out loans, then the system is going to change. And I think there will, there will in the next 10 to 15 years be more 
responsible choices being made for the kinds of jobs that are offered. Because people with tenure track jobs, full-time curatorial positions, mm -hmm. they work their asses off in most cases. Yep. And those are the kinds of positions that we need more of. So let's yep. see if, if we can create that in the next couple of decades. Yeah. So I guess taking a step back, maybe to lighten the mood a bit. So it's like, why did you pursue an Egyptology degree? Yeah. You know, I did you want to be a professor? Was that the ultimate? Kind I have of always wanted to be a teacher yeah. in some way, shape or form. I'm an educator in my bones. I always knew this mm -hmm. when I'm one of four kids. And whenever we played, you know, I was always mm -hmm. the leader teacher person. So this is the way I envision myself. And, and I knew I was going to be a teacher. Um, though when they asked us this question in the second grade and they're like, what are you going to be when you grow yeah. up? And all the girls wrote down teacher because this, I'm, you know, just, born yeah. in 1972, we had a limited number of choices. You could be a nurse, a mm -hmm. teacher, or, and I was like, what else could I be? Everyone's picking teacher or nurse. I can't be those things because everyone's doing it. Cause I always want to be different. So I picked none. <laughs> Like, <laughs> even like, like, like you just Why? leaned into it. I leaned in and I was like, I'm into the different. female, but then sister John Michael loved me for it and, and was nice to me. And she hit the other kids on the head with puppets. So I guess it was a good diplomatic <laughs> move, but, um, I, I suppose I'm a proselytizer of some things, but, um, not necessarily for the Catholic church, no. <laughs> but so that's my, my answer. Number one. And then Egypt, people who study an ancient thing, or a weird thing. They don't ask the other people why they study that yep. weird thing because they know there's no response. Just like it. Right. And then, and then here's the other answer, which is really cool and um, more based on human systems and a little more dark, which is that I'm an upper middle class white female. And as an upper middle class white female, I have the privilege and the opportunities mm -hmm. to do something like this, but I'm not an upper middle class white male and I'm not expected to take on a profession like being mm -hmm. a lawyer or a hedge fund manager or something like that. Yeah. I, can, I can be allowed sweet little thing to go off and do, and do that thing that you weird. love. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why I, Jeff and I always talk about, cause he's the youngest yeah. and I'm like, yeah, your oldest brother's the doctor. So uh -huh. he went and got the like real job. And then his middle brother is like in business. So uh -huh. he got a real job too. So like Jeff's free to go and do. <laughs> and to do the crazy thing, <laughs> yeah. to do the weird and crazy things. But what, what, what about you? For me, I also, teacher was always my, like, I used to play teacher. Yeah. It was always between being a teacher or being a vet. And then when my parents, my dad told Cause me. Cause you have like 18 animals in yeah. your house, right? Yeah. Yeah, and probably. just always grew up with a lot of animals. And I love gym. animals. Mm -mm. And I always wanted to be a vet. And then my dad told me in vet school, you're going to have to operate on dead cats and dogs like to learn how to do and I was like absolutely not done not doing it so, so then I like leaned and then I just always loved <laughs> Egypt yeah because dead things but older yeah yeah um and I just always loved Egypt like from I remember playing a couple like video games when I was really young where it's like city builder pharaoh yeah. Cleopatra and like honestly like watching Brendan Fraser is coming up again, but like the mummy, I like love that movie. Yeah. And just a huge I remember movie for millennials, I think. Going to like the library and our library always having a bunch of like really cool Egypt books and always checking them out yeah. and just always loving anything ancient history. Just always found it fascinating. And so. I love ancient Rome. I yeah. love ancient Greece. I'd be happy um, doing I could have done Vikings. other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, new world stuff, you know, ancient Mayan Aztec things. It's amazing. It's mm -hmm. super fun. Always so anything old and dead. Yep. But yes. Okay. That's a, that's a lighter note. Yeah. So do what you love, be happy, with but sort of, because yeah. do what you love can be so abused by people yep. because they're like, Oh, why don't you do all this extra work for me and work 80 hours a week? Because you're doing what you love or and people it's not really a job. Think a, you know. Our job isn't a job, especially as a grad student. They're like, Oh, you're a student still. And my mom's still like, how's school going? And I'm like, yeah. I'm not really in school anymore. Yeah. I have like a job, you know, or it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on people who don't know what they love. Mm -hmm. And not all of us fall in love with something and you're not, it's not exactly clear what, what you're supposed to do. The, the thing that I usually advise people is instead of trying to hard curate your life and to lead it down mm -hmm. a path so you know it's going to go in this direction and there will be no mistakes, is to know that life is full of mistakes and weird twists and turns. And I would always say yes to as many opportunities mm -hmm. that seem doable and of interest to you than not and see where those things lead you. And if they lead you to a PhD program and you happen to get into one, then that's great. But you don't, have, you can't force these things into yeah. existence. It, it generally doesn't work. And so many of, you know, having friends who apply, apply, apply round after round and don't get mm -hmm. into programs or things like that. And just that yeah. it's 
you know, it doesn't say anything about you. It's not that you're stupid or not good enough. It's just like, these things are, I think like a lot of luck and like happen chances involved in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, a lot of privilege too. a lot of being in the right place like, at the right time and having like the right your, access. Yeah. Your access, what your topic is, if it's sexy at that time mm-hmm. when you're applying and you find the right advisor and you yeah. network and you know the right people and all these other things too, of course. Yeah. But I think a lot of it, you know, people can be very smart, good scholars and, you know, it doesn't work out in their favor. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything, Yeah. but Okay. My next question is, why do you need a graduate degree for, for to, to do any study in ancient Egypt? Yeah. Okay. I, and I get asked this. I think this like, is good because, you know, yeah. we have a lot of like armchair, especially yeah. with Facebook, you know, you can Google things and mm-hmm. find answers to everything. So everyone thinks what we do is, I think we, you know, they don't need to come consult us for things. Right. Uh, like, oh, I can just Google it and get my answer. And I get those emails from people who are having that midlife crisis. Not that there's anything wrong with midlife crises, by the way, I've had a couple of them myself and they're very, they're full, yes, <laughs> seriously. And they're full oh. of opportunities to remake yourself and figure out what the hell is going mm-hmm. on and you just try to do the deep dive into what the hell you're doing. But anyway, I get these emails and people are like, okay, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to apply to grad school. And I go, hold up, hold up, because how old are you and what's your situation and what are you doing? And you could make a turn into something that's more in line with what your training is Mm -hmm. and what your CV or your resume says you can do. Um, But so people will write me and and say, oh, I want to drop everything and be an Egyptologist. And I say, hold up, hold up, because you, you could be trained for a specific thing that could move you into a different direction you don't mm-hmm. expect, where you could be inc- incredibly rich and famous and successful doing that thing. And then you can come back to Egyptology as a donor booster kind of person mm-hmm. where you can help fund excavations and research and get special access to that, that research that people are doing. Um, I work with a lot of people through the Coatsman Institute of Archaeology in particular, but also through the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department who give money to research projects. And they're like, I want to do something. I want to give money for you to go to Egypt and look at these awesome things. And I say, why don't you come and join yeah. on the, the expedition when we go? I, I won't put you on the list um, for security clearance, but you can come and be a part of the process. Mm-hmm. And the that kind of is a, yeah. the, the kind of thing that some people can do who want to be involved in study of the ancient world, but doing a PhD is not the only way. There's so many other things Look, that one could do. You know, bouncing off what you're saying, like, oh, if you have more of, say, like an IT background, so you can use so many, like, you know, that kind of experience to then, you know, use it for archaeology or, yeah. Yeah. you know, data management, yeah. like all these these issues come to play. Yeah. So you can, you know, come at it from a different angle. Yeah. yeah. Versus like, oh, I know how to read hieroglyphs and can quote, I don't know, look at statues. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about that. Just yeah. a different angle. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's lots of things that one can do in this world that can connect with antiquity and you, you don't have to do it in a hard academic way. You really don't. So then for PhDs, if you're getting a PhD, you're very much trying to do the kind of academic professorial yeah, I mean, the PhD locks you in. Yeah. And, and many people know this when they're trying to break out and do something different and they have a CV, an academic CV, and they're trying to get a regular job. Mm-hmm. And people are like, what the hell have you, what is this? I don't understand what all of these things mean because a CV is one thing and a resume is another. And you have to learn how to write a resume so that it shows yep. what you're able to Skill do. Sets are- yeah. Uh, but, and we can get into the kinds mm-hmm. of jobs that people can apply for instead of doing the academic track. But um, yeah, PhD locks you into a particular way of thinking, being perceived in a particular way, just having your work received mm-hmm. in, a, in a certain way. Um, and I dare say some people look at a PhD as being impractical, mm-hmm. that you're not able to do other things. And I would strongly push back against that. PhD is a commodity like anything else. It is a very important higher degree. And if you're working in communities of data management, high level research, intelligence, and other things, there's lots that one can do. It's all you have- it's all about, you know, how you sell it. Yeah. I have these skills that are, you know, applicable in so many different ways. You've been able to, as Remy says, my husband, Remy, that writing a PhD in antiquity means that you're making conclusions based on incomplete data. And that is incredibly useful in many sectors of the world in a very practical and real sense. Mm -hmm. So think of it in that way. 
So we talked a little about terminal master's programs, mm-hmm. but again, just to touch on them. Mm-hmm. So many students are doing those now yeah. first. Yeah. Um, we can, again, we already touched on the ethics. Of oh, and, and I'm trying to avoid only taking students from terminal yeah. master's programs because straight up it's racist because only certain people can afford to do mm-hmm. a terminal master's program, have the opportunities to know what they are. Oh, yeah. And if people are applying to UCLA who are coming from less privileged backgrounds and don't have that access, but they but they have other things and could be trained and you could do the master's at UCLA, we are now looking at those students um, hard now because it's not fair to no. just... And yeah. what schools have undergraduate programs in ancient studies? The Ivy Leagues. Like I went to a state school. Yeah. They, I should be happy. I went they to a state had, school as well. But they had yeah. classics yeah. even, but like most, you can't get Egyptology, you know, undergraduate, unless you go to Brown, Har- yeah. you know, yeah. those. But I went to a state, state school, University of Texas, that would not allow Black Americans into that state school. And so Black Americans went to Texas Southern and other schools that were specifically created for Black Americans. So even with state schools, as we all know, mm-hmm. are excluding certain people mm-hmm. from being a part of those state schools. And the, usually the most competitive state schools like the Texas is University of Texas or th- there's a deep racist past and those mm-hmm. kinds of things need to be dealt with yeah. as well. But it's, you know, it's good that UCLA we acknowledge this and recognize it, but it's yeah. like, I wonder and how many other um, Egyptology PhD programs are they taking this into consideration? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Egyptology is obviously in the United States, extraordinarily white and yeah. uh, that needs to be corrected. I've done other um, discussions about that and you can look those up, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a problem, huge problem. Um, and we need to be taking action yeah, totally. to change. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we mentioned a couple, right? We have Chicago, University of Memphis, mm-hmm. uh, Indiana University, but there's also a bunch of non-US-based ones. Yeah. Um, for the master's program? Yep. For yeah. Masters. AUC, American University, mm-hmm. Cairo is very good. And then you can do like a one year. Um, you can go to, or is Liverpool, Liverpool. is Liverpool two years? Uh, 18 months. 18, 18 months. months. So you can go to University of Liverpool, which is a very good master's. You will pay mm-hmm. to play and you will pay non-resident. Um, you can go to Cambridge or Oxford. You can Oxbridge yeah. it. Um, those are one or two years, depending on what you're yeah. doing. UCL. Just yeah, like University College London. Yeah. Uh, Toronto has one as yeah. well now. Yeah. But, um, so there are options, but mm-hmm. as as you said, most of them are not funded. Yeah. So you're taking out a lot of loans. Yeah. Um, you know, so we do have a German student yes. now at UCLA joining us who's gotten her master's for free because she's a German national and now is coming here and is being supported by our system. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, But if U S citizens go to take an EU school, there's, they're not funded for us. Right. Depends. Um, I know that you can do undergraduate and some masters in some European countries if you have the language abilities mm-hmm. and you're able to gain residency. So that, that is possible, but the language is going to be the barrier mm-hmm. for, for many people. Yep. Yeah. Do we want to touch on the ethics of these programs? I mean, we kind of already have of these in particular, these programs. Just or... overall that a lot of people label them as cash cows right? That's yeah. a way for the university to make a bunch of money. Yeah. Um, Cause people feel, you know, Oh, if I have a master's and it, in a lot of these um, some of them are just like, you have like a master's in humanities. It's very broad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not even focused in, in down into something else. And they're like a one year master's in the humanities and it's, you know, 50 K and the amount of debt that you go into for mm-hmm. these, these two years I'm so you can so get into grad debt. school. It's ridiculous. And no one teaches you or tells you no. not to do this. It's now something that people are talking about, but it's, you know, it's 10 years too late. Mm-hmm. So, um, even the program I did the second year was funded. If your GPA was above a certain number. Um, but even that I still had to take out loans to live and I was a stupid 22 year old. So I was yeah. like, yeah, I'll just take out the full amount not thinking like, oh, I should only take out just what I need and live really like frugal. I took out some student loans when I was at Johns Hopkins because my stipend was quite small, but 
you didn't have to pay those back. The interest didn't accrue mm. when I got my student loans out as a grad student. That has since been changed. Now interest, interest accrues. interest is like almost more than what book. I took out. It's insane. So if you're a grad student and you take on these loans and the interest is accruing while you're in school, I didn't have to start to deal with this until I was done with my eight years. And um, it's, it's well, just kind like, of Didn't they pause it during COVID? I, you know, Something, but it's such a I racket. Saved, like, a couple it's such grand. a racket. And, you know, the, the idea of how student loans work and the pay for play educational system Someone's in the United States. money off of it's people getting education. It's yeah. just a mess. Yeah, it's awful. So where do most of our students come from? I would say we have a pretty good mix. Uh, UCLA is mostly American nationals yep. because it's a state school and we support uh we can't pay non-resident tuition. It comes out of the departmental budget and we generally can't afford it unless we have a center or some sort of endowment that's going to pick that up mm -hmm. for us. We do pay it if we can, if there, we have a, you know, an Egyptian student or a student who's perfect for a particular degree and has, you know, we'll find a way, but most of our students are American residents and that's where we, we focus our money. A lot of California residents as well. It is a state school and that is rewarding. Change your residency when you get here. Yeah, I remember that's true. As soon as you get here, they're like, yeah. change your residency, change your address, because you mm -hmm. have to have established one year yeah. or else you have to start paying out of state tuition. But for me to take a, an already established mm -hmm. California resident, Easier. it's it's almost like getting an extra student in my in my package of graduate students that we that we they pull in every much, year. Yeah. 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 So. so and then most of I would say are coming in with master's degrees. Most are coming, but I think not it's all. changing now. I think more yeah. the newer students are some for straight from undergrad yeah some, you know some people you know work a different job and then yeah. decide to go back to school too, yeah we have a lot of non-traditional students yeah, right now mixed bag. um so some people are coming from indiana some from auc some from chicago some from uh memphis mm -hmm. some from other jobs where they've been out in the private sector and now they're coming back um some a little older some a little younger um yeah so yeah. it's 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 an interesting mixed bag um any other tips for people wanting to get a terminal master's? Obviously, we talked about look, check out, you know, funding, cost, all that good stuff. I think two travel opportunities, you know, if they have yeah. digs or other things related that you can get, you know, on the team and be a part of. And that's get, yeah, getting to think if about. you can get into a program, whether they have a dig or not, if you can get to the place that you're interested in studying, even if it's on some sort of a tour. Um, mm -hmm. and it's not too expensive, that's a really good way yeah. of doing it. Or, and you know, this is way more possible than people know. Yeah. If you, if you are very obsessed with a particular place and you're in a master's program that doesn't bring you over to dig, then you should go there on your own and you should get the visa at the airport almost always and just go with a buddy Easier. and look yeah. around at all of the sites that you possibly can and learn as much as you possibly can on the ground. It's way easier and less expensive than a tour. It's going to cost you at least a quarter of the amount yeah. and you'll have more Especially freedom. You're not paying for like tuition credits or something. Yeah. And even. you'll start to learn the language of the place that you're going mm -hmm. to. In the case of Egypt, you'll start to learn some Egyptian Arabic and figure out how things work and, and, um, and have fun. So I would encourage you to go out and, and learn what you can on the ground. Yeah, definitely travel yeah. Yeah. if you can. So for master's programs in general, what do they, you know, what do they entail? So you say they, they take a bunch of coursework. Yeah, it's write... um, two years of coursework. Mm -hmm. Generally, some places are only one year and usually you write a master's thesis, thesis of yeah. some kind. And that master's thesis is 40 to 50 pages, mm -hmm. more or less, yeah. includes a bunch of images and figures and other things. And you are making a contribution to the field. You are looking at particular data that no one's looked at in this way before. And then you're putting that into a publishable format, and that is what you're working with. And ours, they take exams too, even, right? Yeah, usually. Yeah, so that's usually. So you'll like have language versus mine, exams. I didn't have exams. You'll have one foreign research paper. language, like French or German mm -hmm. or Arabic, um, to show that you can work with your modern language to read stuff. And then you'll have um, your ancient languages. So yeah. if you have like one year of Middle Egyptian or mm -hmm. two years of Middle Egyptian, you'll have maybe have an exam at the end of that. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes the exams happen in the course of the coursework, yep. your exams As are just like part final. of your coursework. Um, and I, I kind of like that better than a big exam at the end Less, sometimes, you know, yeah, popping. comprehensive exams are scary, mm -hmm. um, and just cause a lot of stress for students. <laughs> How did you like your comprehensive exams? I, obviously they're stressful, yeah. it's, you know, you build up a lot just internally and put all this pressure on yourself, but I, 
very much appreciate that within Nelk, we can schedule them out over you don't have to take like all four in one week type of thing i took five yeah six in one week that's insane and my language exam um i i worked on it from 9 a.m till 9 p.m and i'm like i gotta go home and i wasn't finished and i said can i finish it tomorrow and they said sure thing and i didn't tell them because you're embarrassed you know i didn't tell them i worked on this for 12 hours that day and then i came and and my friend next door was doing her acadian exam same deal she was given too much and couldn't get through it. And we're like, okay, let's just go home and we'll come back. So we went home, came back the next day, worked on it for another four hours, which means that my exam took 16 hours. Um, I remember you gave me some like weird pyramid text. I yeah. was like, the words were not in the dictionary. And I was like, <laughs> what, what is this? Like, where did you find this? Like random word, like gobbledygook. And I was like, pyramid what is so this? Hard. But the thing about UCLA exams <sighs> is that you can't take it home. You can't continue yeah. it. It's four hours, hours. That's it. and that's it. Yep. Was it four? Yep. Yeah. And then you're done. And when you get um, done when you get done. And, and I can see what you're able to do and whatnot. And I didn't really care too much because pyramid techs are awful. And <laughs> like, some people are, and you're not doing pyramid yeah, techs. That's not your not area of thing. expertise, not my area of expertise. And so, you know, I can give you something like that and see how you do and go, oh, wow, that was a bust and move on. And it's yeah. okay. It depends on what what culture you're in academically some cultures that you're in academically are much more um trenchant in things being a certain Mm -hmm. way so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i've a few people have failed exams and then have to yeah and and i've failed people in exams And it's not the end of the world. I'm like, oh, you failed but it's your a big exam. Ego. I'm, that's a big ego. <laughs> like, just come back and do it again in two months. And people freak out. Yes. And, or I say, oh, you failed this part of your exam. Write me a paper on this so you can learn. It's funny how you learn more about the things you failed in, certainly, than you, you do about the things that you that. never forget it. Probably, never forget yeah, it. So failure is an opportunity. Never, yeah. never think otherwise. For sure. So, so that's have, master's degrees. My microphone master's degree, it was just two <laughs> years of... Uh, two years of coursework and just a thesis for okay. mine what but was your thesis on um Hathor these Hathor textiles that yeah. the OI has two that are unpublished so I was re you should publish them I, should, I know that should be like a Jarcy article that should be they're out there beautiful too and they're just these weird textiles they're painted yeah there's about 30 of them okay, in I the remember corpus. this now yes um come from Dior because of course I would have read this in her application and you know that's, that was a while ago now. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was, re, you know, recontextualizing them. You should put them back in the corpus, but they're we'll, we'll really beautiful. Afterwards. Great. But they're, they're strange little pieces. But yeah, there's two unpublished at the OI. That's very cool. OI, Oriental Institute. Yes. Which is, yeah. and with the name Oriental Institute, you, it's no surprise that people say OI instead yes. of Oriental Institute. Yeah, I remember we had a class on that about like the whole, the name and, you know, there's been much talk about changing the name and what mm-hmm. that would mean and um, it's tricky i mean oriental it's so known as the oi, OI. It's like, and oriental it's Institute. you know yeah. it's been around for so long to change the name now it's like all the old literature then like mm-hmm. would you confuse people i don't know but. oriental just means east occidental just means west that's fine but the way that the word oriental has been misused yes to orientalize and other people is mm-hmm. highly problematic and that's why the word is is so tricky yeah. so it's it I, I, I brought it up to my department. I still think that we should not be called the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. I think we should be called the Department of West Asian and North African well, Studies. Yeah, Near but... East, you're centering then Europe and yeah, as the as the center and everything east, to the West, West Asian yeah. and North African Studies. Yeah, but that did Geographic. not fly. We'll see. Um, I'll come back to it. I'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's so awesome. Okay, so now moving to PhDs. Yeah, for Egyptology. We don't have that many universities in the states yeah. that offer PhDs in Egyptology. Let's list them. That's Let's us. list them. Um, NYU, mm-hmm. uh, but but I think only the Institute, Institute of Fine Arts, the IFA, right? Yes. And then we have Yale. We have I think Princeton offers a PhD now in an art history on an art history department with Debbie Vaisha. Yeah, yeah. Right? Some of them are in different like sub departments. Right, right, yeah. right. Uh, Michigan. Yep, Michigan. Um, Johns Hopkins, Hopkins, University of Pennsylvania, Harvard. in Philly, Harvard, which is unusual because when I was coming up, there was no PhD in Egyptian studies at Harvard. And now there is with Peter Der mm-hmm. Um, Memphis offers a PhD. Mm-hmm. I believe Emory offers a PhD now with Rune and Yard. Yeah. 
Um, did we mention Chicago or Angel Chicago. Institute? Um, UCLA, Berkeley. Berkeley. Um, Who are we forgetting? And then, of course, you know, you could focus on Egypt in any ancient history department, any yeah. archaeology department, yeah. uh, any art history department. Yeah. Know, Egypt could be your focus. But yeah. if you want just like a, you know, old school Egyptology, Nelk, Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department, there's, you know, less than 20. And keep in mind, this is Egyptology. There is a parallel mm -hmm. and very important avenue of studies in African studies that is anti-Oriental, anti-Egyptological yep. as the, the white colonial discipline that it is. And for those um, African studies departments, you can do Egyptian mm -hmm. data sets and those are all over the country. Yeah, Temple has um, big- Temple's has a, got a you know, really good African program. African studies, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of people doing e yeah. uh, Egyptology. So that's, that's not where we come from, mm -hmm. but we're, I think both of us are, are very interested in trying to put those two streams together yeah. and listen more and be less adversarial and make fewer separations, but, yep. but yes. While studying the same stuff. Yeah. Doesn't matter what department you're in. Or come but, the, from. but the way it's done in a colonial mindset is it's something. So, and yeah. it's something that we, it is the water in which we swim and it is something that you don't even recognize for what it is. And it's, um, something that people are now obviously talking about. What I think it's also more telling if you think internationally, where do we have Egypt programs? Very Europe heavy. Yeah. Um, and many Egyptians know that if they're going to really ascend in their career, the best thing for them to do is get a PhD outside of Egypt mm -hmm. and then go back to Egypt and bring that PhD with them. And, and then they become a very important scholar. And many Egyptians have done this. Is it right? Is it fair? No but it is the way it is. And so those PhD programs are very strong in many universities in Germany, many universities in France, um, many universities in Britain, yep. um, Holland, Czech Republic, Italy, Italy, Czech Republic, um, Hungary, Poland, Poland Austria. Um, yeah, Australia, Japan. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of interest Australia, in Egypt yeah. as, a, as a source of civilization and religious studies yeah. and language. And it's, um, it's interesting how broadly distributed the but study of a, this place is. And I did a search because I, you know, didn't know myself of other, if there was any universities in Africa besides Egypt and like Sudan has a couple of programs, but I had a hard time That's interesting. finding, um, so other. Khartoum, you, you found mm -hmm. places there. I think the Sheikh Diop. Yeah. They yeah. have a program. Yeah. Um, but that's the only one I could find. It's interesting. Yeah. So very And I'm in contact with some people with, in uh, Morocco mm -hmm. who are doing studies, but it's not a traditional Egyptology yeah. sort of program and that's fine. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. very, you know, the West and where they colonize. Yeah. <laughs> heavy. And in Egypt, it's interesting. There's also a, a separation between two tracks of study. You can either do the traditional Egyptology mm -hmm. track, or you can do the tourism degree. Yep. And it seems strange. You would get a PhD in a tourism university, but it, they're both Egyptology degrees. One is more arguably more foreign language, research foreign language heavy, and more focused on the English and the French and the German mm -hmm. and other things. But um, but the, and there's competition between the two, but both of those PhDs yeah. are are valid. So international programs. Yeah, we're talking about Egypt and um, tourism, but obviously, if you're leading tours, you need to have just as much education and yep. background. You're that you know that you're telling giving to the tourists yep. and yep. you know still a so doing the opposite of what a lot of U.S. museums are doing instead of giving things to docents, volunteer based there. Doubling you know, down they, on yeah, they're making ed sure that their... their tour guides are very well educated mm -hmm. and often have master's degrees and have excellent foreign language skills and are able to lead tours of people from China to yep. Greece to Russia. It's amazing how Egyptian tour guides get along and how clever they are. So yeah, yeah. Um, so thinking more about PhDs, this always confused me: the difference between American. Yeah. And a European PhD. Very program. different. Very different. Very different. Okay. So if you're applying for a European PhD, yeah. 
you are applying to work very much alone, very solo with a topic that you are presenting and you often have to wait for funding to be available. Sometimes they give you the topic ahead of time. Like sometimes, we're looking for yeah. someone who wants to do this topic. Sometimes the topic is imposed upon yeah. you by the funding that is available through a European like, resource. Yeah, yes, it's totally true. Um, yeah, we're looking for, for a PhD in Sudanese pottery yeah, of yeah. this and that mm -hmm. time period, yes. And you apply in, a, in that very specific rubric of what you want your PhD to be in. And then you are meant to get through that program in three to four years, right? Yeah, no coursework. Right, yeah. which means like, so, so let's stick with Britain for a moment. So let's say that you do your undergrad in Britain, you finish when you're 19 mm -hmm. and you do a master's for two years. So you're 21 and then you apply successfully and get into a PhD program and you spend four years there. So you could be finished by the time you're 25 or 26 years old, insane. which is insane for Americans yeah. in humanities PhD programs. It is absolutely insane, but it is de rigueur in Britain. That is the way that the situation works here. You will apply to a PhD program and you will have to do more coursework it, before you even decide what your, your PhD is going, what your dissertation is going yeah. to be on. And you will do minimum three years coursework. Yeah. I think some universities are two years. Yeah. So some universities are two years of coursework, some are three, but you need to do that coursework. And that coursework can be on anything. Like, what do we have a seminar on coming up? We have late period mm -hmm. late history. Period. We're going to do reuse mm -hmm. of temples and statuary after that. And then we have a third intermediate period seminar. Yeah. And so there's there's stuff all across the board. You're going to be studying things that you're not going to write your dissertation yeah, on. Trying to get well-rounded mm -hmm. education on all aspects of. And then the come your third year, you take your comprehensive exams, mm -hmm. you propose your PhD topic, yep. and then you spend the next three years Two writing three. that topic. So in the United States with a master's, you want to get through in six or seven years. But I would say in an American PhD program with an MA. Five is fast. Five is super fast. But I've some, seen it done. It's, it happens. It can it's, be done. Yeah. Um, but most but, yeah. standard is six. And in Egyptology, let's be honest, these foreign languages are a beast. They take forever to learn. And I would say, you know, it's going to be, it's a loud day in Los Angeles. Today, it's like ambulances. It's a loud day in Los Angeles. And then a fly lands uh, on my Yeah, nose. like seven, six, seven. I think, how long yeah. are you going to take? Seven. Seven? Yeah. That's okay. I, I took eight, but I took a year off to teach at Howard. Um, and I got a... A fellowship that was a two-year fellowship so it took me a little bit yeah. longer but it's, it's and fine. then you know certain i know some people it's like they're in their 10th year and plus and just you know life happens people get married have kids and these are people that we call get... all but dissertation and some of yep. them leave with all but dissertation and never come back to the dissertation and that's just it's kind of like an informal terminal masters and that's fine yeah. that's that's the way it turns out for many people finishing that phd is finishing a book and it, it's, it's a lot, it yeah. takes a lot. And you need mentoring and leadership to get you through it. You need a university that pushes you through mm -hmm. like UCLA does not let you spend 10 years on this. Yeah. They are keeping they're a like, close watch on you. Grad division is like, I'm sorry. Why haven't you done this or that? They're like, yeah, you've TA'd too much. Okay. No more job for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you guys know that if you push this, you're going to be unemployed mm -hmm. and you're part of a union, you're well-paid, yep. you, you know, you, you want to keep this situation, but, but you, you don't want to linger forever. You, you don't want to linger, linger that long. You cannot it's not linger. good for you either. No. I think no. people would be like, why, you know, unless you were doing something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. So that's the main difference between European. You just come in and you write Yeah. two, three years and you produce a product and then- I mean, let me be clear. I yeah. don't know anybody who's French or German who's gotten their PhD by the age of 25. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, and these, it, it takes um, it takes a long time. When I feel like there's more programs. pressure than to do, you know, postdocs and in Europe to do like more post, you know, um, dissertation projects before they can get then a job a lot of times too. If you do a PhD and you get through by the time you're 25 or 26, a postdoc is essential. But in the same age of anti-humanities intellectualism, those postdocs have been cut as well. Yeah. And so it's really hard to get, there's not as many postdocs and those that exist, the applications can be in the hundreds mm -hmm. for one spot. Or it can be super like, you know, so niche. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, 
how do you make your research apply for this really niche project mm -hmm. and yeah crazy things that okay so for everyone out there if they're interested in applying for a phd or want to just know about the process i get this question all the time where you know you say oh i'm in a phd program and people are like um i was in an uber the other day and they were like what like is that actually like what do you do like how do you even apply you know people don't know what these things are no one told me ever also you know it's one of these things you kind of get thrown into the fire and you just learn about how to apply and what the application process is so what what is the application process so what's required you want to at the university that you're at to connect with mentors who will help to advise you on this process. Most of the time at the university that you're at, you will be taught by people who have PhDs and who have been through mm -hmm. this process. Maybe not in your field that you want to go into, but in a field and they will be helpful to yep. you. You will also need them to write good letters of recommendation on your behalf. So you wanna have a good connection with the professors at yep. university. So that's step one. Yes. Step two is you need your research languages and you need to know what research languages you will need for what it is you're going on into. So say you're doing Italian, Roman, ancient Roman archeology, span you will need Italian, and Latin. right? You will need Latin. You will, you will need certain languages that are different than what you would need for an Egyptology mm -hmm. degree or an Aztec or, archeology yeah, study. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you'll need different things, but you wanna find out what those languages are fast and early because languages take time. You can't like decide, oh, I'm going to do this amazing thing and become this kind of a German, PhD and I'll just pick up German. It's not going to happen. Yep. You can't just pick up these languages. They take, they take a long time to develop and come into your brain. If you can get into intensive courses over a summer, that's great, but it still takes time to, yep. to know what you need and to set those things up. So and those are usually listed on, you know, the website of yeah. the place you're applying to. So there's usually a you know, a tab that goes over what is required and, yeah. you know, what the package, uh, what they're looking for, Yeah. you know, preferably, oh, you have some French or German or right. whatever. Right. Does GPA matter when people are applying? GPA matters because now GRE increasingly doesn't matter. So the graduate record, what question. is it called? Graduate record examination? What the hell is it? Stanford. GRE. Uh, the, G, the graduate whatever exam. Yeah, I think, I think it is record. Yeah, record I think exam right. is increasingly not being asked for at UCLA it is currently optional because the GRE measures as we now know through tests and and evidence <laughs> it measures how well you take a test yes. and it measures your privilege of being in context where that kind of test taking skill is taught mm -hmm. and if you are not in that kind of context or that kind of test taking skill your GREs are going to be lower but it doesn't mean that you couldn't write a very interesting contributory PhD. Yep. So we're oh, moving yeah. GREs to the side, at least at UCLA and looking towards GPA. I know. Absurd too. I but you I had to do the GRE. I took the GRE, took it. My game plan was I'm going to go in and take it once, just cold turkey, like just yeah. go in and take it. How'd that go? I did fine. Yeah. But then after that, I tailored my studying to see exact, I just gave them exactly what they wanted and I took it again. And it was like so much better. Really? Yep. It's amazing. I and took math the, score was the highest, which I'm very proud that's of. That's strange. I was like, I'm good at math. No, I took the GRE and my math score was abysmal, but oh, I had an almost perfect verbal. It was almost perfect. Mm -hmm. So I need a high five for that. So there's my testing well, write, skills and verbal stuff. Good books. Whatever. And my, my, <laughs> I don't think they do it anymore because now it's a writing section, but yeah, there was writing. And then there's like, pick the best. We word. had a logic section there's where it's like, oh, I yes. hated it. If Mary is sitting next to Pete uh -huh. and Pete is on the bus, where is Fred? And I'm like, who the fuck is Fred? Yep. And it just. <laughs> I hated that. They, were, they like searched you before you went in. <laughs> yes, they, like, or, yes. You. You're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to pee. You're only like Ugh. no water. And really, I think the Princeton Review deserves less money from all of uh, this. And it's, it's a boondoggle. And like it's two hundred dollars. Wow. Do we hate the GRE or what? We hate the GRE. It's two hundred dollars, and then some bullshit. They right don't there. give you your test results, but they're like, "Do you want to send these to a school for free?" And you're yeah. like, "Well, no, because if they're awful, I don't want to send them somewhere." So then you wait. And then you, they charge you 50 bucks. Of per. course they charge you 50 bucks. Ridiculous. We haven't even gotten into application costs no, and how you yep. have to pay to apply to each of these so, schools, which are a couple hundred dollars to apply to each one. Spent like, and if you want to diversify and apply to eight different schools to make sure you get into yep. one, well, you can it's, just count. That's almost two, two grand for yep. you to apply. Two grand. That's crazy. And then you're paying for the GRE. Yeah. To get some places, you're paying for your transcript. And we wonder why there's only white people in yeah. academia. Yep. You have to have... <laughs> 
and like even like a lot of programs will have oh you can fill out this paperwork and they'll waive the fee yeah it's such like a process to fill out the paperwork it you're is. like i'll just pay the hundred dollars like yeah yeah you know it's true Okay, so we did. We touched on GREs, right? G, oh, GPA, GPA. So GPA, GPA matters. More. Um, GPA is important. The way I look at GPA, so say you've got a C minus in calculus, I'm going to yeah. be like, Meh, don't really care because you're not going to be doing calculus with me. But if I see that you have a B in something that's like archaeology or uh, yeah. uh, Middle Egyptian, if you were able to take it, or English, you know, it's, you may have had a professor you didn't really like, but if it's in the area that you want to move forward with, mm -hmm. and it's like, I, I, that that's going to be hard for me to see. Oh, like ancient languages, if you did any ancient language, like, oh, you took Latin and yeah. you did poor. It's like, oh, that's maybe not a good sign for taking yeah, because glyphs. Yeah, because ancient languages, it's a particular use of your brain. And if I see you didn't do that well in Greek or Latin, and now you're going to do Middle Egyptian, I might be a little leery about, about some of those grades. If I see one B in like Middle Egyptian or Middle, or, I don't know why I keep saying Middle, Ancient Egyptian civilization or something. And there's only one. I'll be like, okay, there's only one. But if I see those consistently, yeah. then you're not a PhD level student. You're a student who's good. Bs are good, but you're not a student that's going to be able to obsessively put all of your energy and yeah. brain power and interest into this crazy, lonely, difficult pursuit it, for the next six to seven to eight years. It says more, not so much that you pick your intelligence. It's like how hard are you willing to work because yeah. it's it's such a process and and you need to be a bit of a perfectionist yes in this and i'm always telling my grad students and you know this i'm like stop being a perfectionist all the time but that's because the people who uh -huh. come to us all like are already perfectionist. So I'm already fighting against the perfectionist tendencies mm -hmm. that are coming to me and trying to get people to believe in themselves more, to publish things, even when they think it's not perfect and to finish a goddamn project instead of holding on to it until the last possible minute. So I'm, I'm always saying, stop being a perfectionist, but that's because of the kinds of people nature, that are drawn yeah. towards this, this kind of study. Oh, yeah. we could, we could, just makes me think of like imposter syndrome. Oh, that'd yeah. be a whole other. That's its own thing. That's that should be thing. its own podcast. Should I think be. that's really interesting. It's yeah, a good one though. It's it is a good one. It's and I still have it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll mm -hmm. always have it. I'll have it till I die. Yeah, I think we all do. I didn't but... get it until master's program. You didn't have imposter syndrome till your master's program. Mm -hmm. Um, I, yeah. I think I've always had it. Always, 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 always. Um, I ever since I, I have like I have like a marked memory of like when it started. So you were like cocky and confident and yeah. able to do no wrong, and then they destroyed you and broke you. And down. then there was a specific huh. paper that got poor comments on and like yeah. broke me inside. You know, I saw that in grad school at Hopkins. I like I, this saw. I just remember like sobbing. Really? Like my, oh yeah. This Sobbed. this one grad school came in super perfectionist, super brilliant, got all the money, and one um, situation in which they did not get a particular fa fellowship, mm -hmm. and that was it. It was over. Yeah. Like the whole career was over yeah. at that point. It was it was interesting to see. But I think it's um, failure can be very yeah. good. Yeah, it's it good. Very good. Now I look back and I'm like, it was you know a learning experience. An early kind of failure stuff, can but, be very good. Yeah. This is why they say boys often out excel girls because they're so damn rambunctious. I'm the mother of an 11 year old boy and they're bouncing and they're always being told, no, sit down, no, do this. No, hold your pencil. No, d chew with your mouth closed or whatever. I'm not saying girls are all sweet and perfect and I don't want to get too binary here, but I think in our world that believes in these be binaries, boys are, they fail early and, mm -hmm. and fast and girls are rewarded for being perfect. And so when girls fail, they don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And boys oh, yeah. are like, what? I can deal with this. And so you have more achievement of males in STEM type things and, yep. and other when, more male oriented um, and like pursuits. How, and I did scare quotes for those of you that are listening like to Spotify ADD, for male oriented. Even within, you know, uh, learning disabilities, ADD, yeah. girls tend to show symptoms differently we're yeah. you know maybe less fidgety because we're told to you know sit people mm -hmm. sit on their hands to hide mm -hmm. it or things like that so um you know how we're socially conditioned we show you know disorders or anything you know things like that differently and yeah boys are diagnosed but girls tend not to be diagnosed with things and yeah then it plagues them and they're not getting the help or whatever. I've always been super insecure about what I know and don't know but in some ways I think it's helped me because I have to I'm always second guessing myself mm -hmm. It, it can be an issue, but it can be um, useful as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, we went on. That's a, a whole other episode <laughs> we could talk about. But yeah, I have. 
I do have a memory when I was, I think I always was like that though. I was always, cause I'm competitive. Yeah. So I'm always just being competitive with my not, brother. Not competitive. And like, if he scored better than me, I would like cry in my closet. No, and... I was always the teacher creating the games in which everyone got a trophy. Oh, I wanted to win. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, we covered grades. So you have to submit, you know, your transcript. Mm -hmm. uh, GRE is a maybe depending on the program. Mm -hmm. But I, I think- as a, time, lot as time goes on, a lot of programs take GREs. A lot do. A lot do. So That's... you'll see. And you may decide to lean towards a certain program because they don't require GREs rather than other. And that, yeah. that's fine. Depending on the type of, you know, test taker you are. Yeah. Um, It'll say a lot about the program, yeah. to be honest. And then CV, what kind of experience are you looking? Yeah, CVs are useful for just a snapshot of all the things that a student has done. So I can see foreign languages and I can see um, Egyptian language. I can see how many years they've done of something. I can quickly see a snapshot of what universities they've been at. We are pedigreeing all of these universities, you guys. It's not necessarily fair, but mm -hmm. if I see somebody coming from a less traditional background and from a state school, but I can tell that they're going out of their way yeah. to find certain courses and certain areas and get what they think they need, then that will win points with me. So if you're coming from a less privileged background, but you're still working to get what it is you need, you, you could very well yeah. be noticed. In, yeah. It sucks yeah. that it's like, there has to be a way of, you know, shortening the list. And in most yeah. cases, it's not fair. No, because, or you don't give people a chance to, you know, have a rebuttal No, and say, oh, I got to see because of this, you know, it's just there. Okay. So your rebuttal should be, so in your statement of purpose that you mm. were writing for each of these different programs, if you have something that's a black mark that you think is popping out and you're like, they're going to totally notice this. Um, like you got horrible grades before you transferred to another university, mm -hmm. or Took you had more. a, you, you had a really tough time when a family member died and you, it took you a while to get through and your grades suffered. I would start your statement of purpose by saying, or put it at the bottom as a note, just a note. If you notice these poor grades, it is because of this very straight ahead. Don't go, you don't have to go into too much detail, but if you need to explain something, mm -hmm. I would pre rebuttal yeah. for, for some yeah. of these things Attack. that might be perceived as like a I always a different major. Mm -hmm. I was a calc major and yeah, that's why I got really bad major. Absolutely. I can I see switch. that. I look at a transcript yeah. and I can see it. I'm like, oh, it looks like they started in like science, math and engineering <laughs> and then moved over to the humanities because that's where their heart and mind was. That's fine. Yeah. I can usually see that kind yeah. of thing. But if you want to explain it, yeah. I, I think that's not a yeah. stupid thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So you covered letters of recommendation, which yeah. I think matter a lot. Letters of rec, I, if the person has what they need, I always read them. So obviously at UCLA, I'm dealing with 60 to 70 applications for a couple of spots. And that's, that's a lot for me to oh, read. Oh yeah, we should talk about just, just the, in general, there's only what, four stats. spots yeah. a year. Um, there's rarely four at UCLA. Yeah. I would if say usually two. two, sometimes three with the Coatsen and with the NELC yeah. department. Um, and with the amount of applications that we get total and then how that's winnowed down, if I see that somebody doesn't have what they need and it's a non-starter, I'm not going to read the letters of rec. Okay. And I'm just not going to get that far. And I apologize. Um, but if I do get that far, the letters of rec are really important. And if I know the people mm -hmm. who are writing the letters of rec, um, I might sometimes, because letters of rec are their own game. They are their own game. And people don't want to write negative letters of rec, though I have read them. Mm -hmm. um, and they they'll say everything positive and effusively. And so you have to read between the lines say, of the letter just of like rec. a kind of boring letter, nothing. If like, it's oh, a, they... nah, the student did this and they were okay. And then you're like, okay, I'm left wanting. I don't understand. Sometimes I will contact that person mm -hmm. and write a quick email and say, if I'm really interested in a student and I'm going to work closely and spend the next seven, eight years of my life with that student, then I need to make sure that that mm -hmm. student is okay. So I'll write a quick email and say, what about this student? What do you think? Yeah. And that can be very helpful. The most helpful thing for me, and I'm sure this is one of your questions that you're going to be getting to, is to talk to the student yep. and have a give and take interview, which I don't want you to be nervous about. I want you to just talk to me and, and I can get an idea of what kinds of research questions mm -hmm. you have, how you see the world, wh what you might, how you might develop going forward, what, what you've seen and what you haven't seen. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if it's Egypt. I'm not testing you on what you know about Egypt. I want to see what kinds of things you're, yeah, what kinds of questions like, you're like interested in. If you would department. be a good fit. Yeah. Um, and if I see somebody who's just kind of doesn't have a lot of ideas or doesn't have a lot to say, or um, 
there's just kind of, I, I don't see the fire there for whatever mm-hmm. reason. That's, that's another yeah, important the drive. Yeah. yeah. So converse, and I usually do those conversations on the phone. I talk to you, I think when you were picking up Julian. Yeah, I often do them on the phone in my car, yeah. in my car, because I have to, because, and so then it, it probably puts the person at ease because yeah, I'll be like, did. I'm driving in my car yeah. and I can't, and you can hear all the noise yep. around me. And, I'm and then like, I was I, like, okay, it's less like, it's not like we're in this like cold, and I'm not looking sterile, at TV Zoom, it's not this know? like sterile environment. No. Like we're sitting in front of each other. Yeah. No, it no. was like, okay, like, and I'll repeat you're the real, question again. You're a real human I being. What I asked. Like you're a real person. Oh, there's yeah. lots of faults that usually when I'm talking to people from the cars, I'm like, oh my God. And I might say a bad word. I remember or... <laughs> you were going through your divorce and I yeah. said, oh, I can imagine that's hard. And you were like, I hope you never <laughs> have to imagine I have the experience that I was like, okay. <laughs> and I would have to tell people about Ooh. going through that divorce because it took so much of my time. Oh yeah. And when you have a little kid, my kid was only four and a half. When I started that mm-hmm. process, you have to have your, like, I would be like, I have to go right now. I, I have to take this call and get off a call and go on to another call because I never knew when somebody was going to yeah. be calling me about this or that. And so I would, and I would tell people, I'm not going to be like, Oh, I had a personal matter. I'd be like, I'm going through divorce. It's very difficult. And so everyone knew, um, including you, apparently when I was interviewing you for the first time, that's not surprising knowing yeah, me, not that's surprising funny. at all. But, um, so, so letters of rec are important yep. and you, to get a good letter of rec, I would avoid getting the most important person necessarily, unless it's a, an important Egyptologist and then you want that person. And I'll be like, why do you not have this person? Yeah. But if you're coming from a state school where there are no Egyptologists, you want the person who knows your work the best mm-hmm. and the person with whom you've worked the most. And what is ideal for me is getting a letter of rec from a professor who led an independent study, mm-hmm. an honors thesis writing mm-hmm. for the undergraduate program or something like that. Yeah. And those intimate. are the, yeah, they know you. They know the way you think. Yeah. And that's the most useful yeah. letter of rec for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess avoid people who might write you a bad one. But it's hard to, know. It is hard to know. Or I always, you know, it probably it's very hurtful if someone, if you go to a professor and you say, can you like me, write me a letter? And they yeah. say no. But I'd yeah, rather, I would, take it. I would rather have the no versus the sure, I'm going to write you one and have it be mean. I've gotten some bad letters of rec. Yeah. Everyone has seen some bad letters of rec. And, and they usually make your eyebrows raise and go, mm, I feel like it that's says interesting. more about the person writing. Sometimes a, you're the like, bad letter of rec is deserved. I have found, mm-hmm. and I have found this out the hard way or the easy way. Um, and sometimes those red flags and those letters of rec are well-deserved. Some people mm-hmm. are a certain kind of person that needs things their way or doesn't follow through or whatever yep. those red flags might be. And it's good to follow up and check yeah. some letters of rec. Uh, have been not deserved. And I have read hatchet jobs of students who just didn't get along with their professor. Yeah. And then when I check on it, I'm like, oh, look at that. There's just some personal stuff going on here. A little bit of competition, something that is um, something human, else. natural human reaction. But it's something that if you're interested in a student and you can see the ability in the rest mm-hmm. of the dossier that I will read around. Um, yeah. And I also will tell you if... Um, if I then take you on and you become somebody who's working with me and I am your mentor, I will tell you who wrote you that bad letter of rec. And I will tell you not to ever ask Don't for ask that letter for writer yeah. again, because it's not going to serve yeah. you so, Or all. it's undeserved and, yeah. you know, don't put yourself in that position. Yeah. I always find it when sometimes undergrads will ask me as a TA mm-hmm. and I'm always like, I always caution them. I'm like, I know, like, maybe I know you best. Yeah. Um, but I'm always like, I have, so so would your suggestion be, you know, cause like I have no position, you know, no, I, have no... I, I, so I co-write letters with my TAs oh, okay. because yes, the yes, TAs are, you're working with the student on the paper writing, you're in the trenches with them and you know, their work the best. So what I do when students ask for a letter from my, my class, women in power, which Jordan is lead TA on teaching mm-hmm. assistant for those who didn't know are, um, big classes, huge 200 plus, yeah. right? Yeah. So with a 200 plus class, I can't write all these letters of rec and people will write me and I'll say, who is your TA? And then I connect with that TA mm-hmm. and the TA writes the bulk of the letter. And then I package it with my, 
um, letterhead and and my signature, yeah. but then I co-write it with yeah. that other person. So and you that get works more intimate, yeah, yeah, understanding instead of being like, yeah, they got this grade, and that's all I know about them. No. And those letters of record are not so useful. So if you have a choice between somebody that you were in a big class with who's really important, and they're not going to be able to say a whole lot, versus somebody who really knows you very well, and they'll be able to say more, go with that other mm -hmm. person that's more useful. Or in a lot of cases, they ask for two or three, so you can try both angles yeah. you know like or one more intimate problem. one more maybe a bigger name or whatever. avoid this problem to begin with so if you have the important person that you're in the big class with and you're able to do an honors yep. program with them ask to do it think ahead so for those of you that are like oh i know i want to apply for grad studies in the humanities and you're at a you're a sophomore yep. or a junior and you can do Start the senior thesis you want to connect with that big person and ask if they can lead you through this independent study to write the senior thesis then you will get the good letter so yeah. that's what you want to prepare for yeah. so you don't have these problems as you're working towards the application yeah yeah don't let them sneak up on you yeah the other thing they usually ask for is a writing sample mm -hmm. right so if you did a senior thesis yeah. or a master's thesis if you have a master's that's usually yeah. you know you submit either a part of it or yeah. it's like what 20 pages usually writing samples are really really important mm -hmm. and it's something that i'll look at to determine whether you're a describer or an analyzer mm -hmm. are you going to just tell me a book report that's already been told and give me the coffee table book of egyptology or whatever or are you going to work with data and analyze it and make a contribution to the field and the difference between those two is it can be pretty far but it's instantly recognizable mm -hmm. so that that's where you want to put yourself into a situation in which you're able to write something that's more than your typical undergraduate paper because yeah. your typical undergraduate paper is not going to get you into a high level phd program that's fully supported yeah. so put yourself into that that position to be able to write that that high level research yep. yeah. that's important yeah I want to see tables or little flow charts or yeah, data or work with data. visual data that kind of thing so the last thing I think is really important to yeah. start early. And I think you kind of mentioned it with letters of recommendation, but networking. Yeah. So just talking yeah. to who you're applying to work with yeah. before you just apply, write, send them an email, say, yeah. introduce yourself. So you're not just a name on a piece of paper and networking doesn't mean you have to go to the conference yeah. of the thing that you're going to do and talk to the right professors necessarily. It can be part of it, but that's hard for an undergrad. Scary. To do. Very scary, very, very scary. hard. And you don't know, I didn't know shit about what I was going to do no. or what was expected of me. So what's most important is net networking within the context, within the university or college that you were at, mm -hmm. finding the mentors there who can support you and getting the writing sample, getting the research languages, um, getting the letters of rec. You can't get those things without the relationships that you want. And so I will I will answer this question by saying, yes, start early, but also make all of this about human relationships because mm -hmm. that's what's going to make the PhD process work for you. If you try to do it alone, you try to game the system, you try to just read on the internet what you need and not reach out to other people and not sit in an office hours and not go and talk with people, you will not be able to do it. It's, it is a game of relationships and people who will support you yeah. going down but the even long also, road. The programs you're applying to make sure you're like a fit for them or yeah. they work for you right yeah. so talk to the people who are already there yeah right talk to the students and are they happy that's like a, such a big thing because they'll tell you like honest you know, okay so this honest. is something you know that i do yes. so when somebody is like a serious student to come to ucla they're asking me um do, you know what is it like there first thing i do if i'm really heavily recruiting is i have them talk to our students because I can tell them everything here is awesome. And yep. here's why it awesome. It, it's awesome. But you're not going to say it's what shit. am I going to say? <laughs> I'm going to say that it's awesome. But yeah. if they talk to you guys and they get an understanding of the social context that they'll be mm -hmm. a part of, what kind of a community we have mm -hmm. built here, um, what yeah. the money situation is, what how how Where professors work, what the committees yeah. for dissertations are like, all of these things. If they talk to you guys, that's going to get you the real story. So if you are thinking of going to one of these programs that we've discussed, one of the best things that you can do is reach out to a graduate student who's already there and ask them all of these questions. Yep. Say, what's the money like? How do pe how do they decide who to give what money to and whatnot? How about, um, you know, the timing? How long does it take you to get through the program? Just go through all of these questions that you can 
and and learn as much as you can from these from these graduate students. They're they're in the trenches and they know. They give you the best info. Yes. Even best where info. to live and and what the professors they're actually like yeah. on the phone. I'm gonna be like, I'm awesome, mm -hmm. but I might not be awesome. I might be a raving lunatic who like takes your work or something. <laughs> you don't know that. Yep. You're not gonna learn that unless you talk to a graduate student who might tell you subtly in mm -hmm. ways that you don't know. Undergraduates are kind of dense. I was dense. Were you dense? Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know the yes. political game. And so you, you I thought might, it was like, I have good grades. I'm smart. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. I'll just continue with more yeah. school. This seems like a good track. Yep. But the you need to get political and try to figure out how these things work and read between the lines, mm -hmm. hear between the lines um, yep. quickly. Try to figure that that stuff out. Right. Yeah. So in our chronology of working through uh, PhD programs, we're at the point of you're in the PhD, PhD now. So we're yeah. going to pause for a part two and that second half we'll be covering, you know, the PhD process, funding opportunities, employment, all that good stuff. So okay, good. we'll talk about that then. Okay. See you guys soon. See you. Thank you to our listeners for your support and for subscribing wherever you listen. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review and help raise our profile and let others know about it. Send your questions related to the show and topic suggestions for future episodes to karakuni at gmail.com. You can find the video version of the show on my YouTube page and full show notes will be posted in the podcast section of my website, karakuni.squarespace.com. For that, thank you, Amber Myers Wells. There you'll also find info on my books, upcoming lectures, and you can subscribe to my newsletter. You can find me on Facebook at Karakuni Egyptologist and on Twitter and Instagram at Karakuni. See you next time on Afterlives with Karakuni.